on memory and recollection in parva naturalia by aristotle translated by william alexander hammond this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards chapter one in regard to memory and its process we must determine what its nature is by what agency it is produced and to what physical organ the phenomenon of memory as well as that of recollection is to be ascribed for the same persons are not endowed with good memory and good recollection but as a rule phlegmatic natures remember well while the quick and ready-witted are apt at recollection first of all we must grasp what is understood by the object of memory for one is often mistaken about this the future cannot be the object of memory this is rather the object of conjecture and expectation and we might even have a science of expectation as some describe the subject of prophecy neither can the present be its subject matter for our senses are concerned with this by sensation we do not have cognizance either of the future or of the past but only of the present memory on the other hand regards the past no person would say that he remembers the present while it is present e g that he remembers seeing the white object while he sees it neither does one remember the object of contemplation so long as the act of contemplation and thought continues but one merely says that in the former case one sees and in the latter one knows when however one possesses knowledge or sensation which is not in actuality then one remembers that the angles of a triangle are equal to two right angles because one has learned it or thought it out or on the other hand has merely heard it or visually observed it or found it out in some such way for when memory actually takes place one must say that the process in the soul is such that one formerly heard perceived or thought the thing consequently memory is neither sensation nor conceptual thought but it is the condition or modified form of one of these after the lapse of time there is no memory of the present in the present moment as we have said but there is perception of the present expectation of the future and memory of the past consequently all memory is associated with time therefore only those creatures that have perception of time have memory and memory attaches to that organ whereby time is perceived now we have already discussed imagination in the treatise on the soul and we concluded there that thought is impossible without an image for we find in thought the same conditions as in drawing figures in the latter without needing a triangle of a definite magnitude we nevertheless draw a triangle of definite size so too the thinking mind even if it does not think a magnitude still places a quantitative body before its eyes although it does not think it as such if it is the nature of the quantitative in an indefinite sense with which the mind is concerned then thought represents it under the form of a definite quantity but thinks it merely as quantity the reason why it is impossible to think anything apart from continuity bracket even things that are not subject to the laws of time cannot be thought without time close bracket is a problem that belongs elsewhere we must be conscious of magnitude and motion by the same faculty whereby we are conscious of time an image is a product of sensation in general evidently therefore the cognition of these things is to be ascribed to the primary power of sense memory even the memory of concepts does not take place without an image consequently memory concerns the faculty of thought accidentally and the primary power of sense intrinsically it is therefore possessed by other animals and is not peculiar to man and creatures endowed with opinion and thought if it were a property belonging to the conceptual powers it would not be found in many animals outside of man perhaps in none of the brutes seeing that they do not as a matter of fact possess it 
because they all lack the sense of time for in an activity of memory as we remarked before there is always the additional consciousness that one has seen or heard or learned this in time past prior and later are properties of time in reply to the question to what part of the soul memory is to be ascribed it is plain that it belongs to the same part as imagination the objects of memory intrinsically are the same as the objects of imagination accidentally they are such objects as are impossible without imagination the question might be asked how in the world is it that while a mental impression persists although the thing itself is no longer at hand one remembers what is not present evidently we must regard this phenomenon which through the mediation of sensation is produced in the soul and in that part of the body which possesses sensation whose persistence we call memory as similar to a painting for an active stimulus stamps on the soul a sort of imprint of the sensation analogous to stamping with a seal ring for this reason too persons who are deeply moved by passion or by the ardour of youth do not remember just as if the effort and the seal were applied to running water in other persons because of their worn-out condition like old buildings or because of the hardness of the receptive principle no impression is made consequently the very young and the aged have poor memories for the former are in a fluent condition owing to their growth and the latter are unstable owing to their decay likewise the excessively quick and the excessively slow seem to have poor memories the former are too moist and the latter too hard consequently the image does not last in the souls of the former and in the latter it does not fasten if such is the truth regarding memory the question arises whether one remembers the impression or the thing from which the impression was derived for if it is this impression of ours which is the object of memory then we do not remember what is absent on the other hand if it is the thing that we remember how does it come that while we perceive this impression we remember what we do not perceive viz the absent thing and if memory is analogous to an imprint or picture within us why should the perception of precisely this thing be the memory of something else and not the memory of just this picture for it is this impression which one contemplates and perceives in actual memory in what sense then does one remember what is not present it would then be possible to see and to hear what is not present or is there a sense in which this is possible and in which it actually occurs for example the animal in a picture is both animal and a copy and both of these are one and the same thing but the mode of existence in the two instances is different and it is possible to regard this picture both in the sense of animal and in the sense of image and so it is with the image within us we must regard it both as something in itself and as the image of something else in so far as we regard it in its own nature it is an idea or a mental representation in so far as we regard it as belonging to something else it is a copy or a memory when therefore an actual stimulation of this image takes place and when the soul perceives it in its own nature it appears to come to expression as an idea or a phantasm if however the soul regards it as belonging to something else then as in the case of a painting the soul contemplates it as a copy and as the picture of coriscus without having ever seen him the points of view here and in the case of our regarding a painted animal merely as an animal are different what arises in the soul in the latter case is purely a thought in the former case because the object is there regarded as an image it appears as a memory and consequently there are times when we do not know regarding such physical processes due to earlier sensations whether they are produced by sense experience and we are in doubt whether they are a memory or not at another time it happens we think and recall that we have heard or known the thing in the past
this takes place when after contemplating a thing in its own nature one shifts one's position and regards it as the copy of another thing the converse of this also happens as is shown by the case of antiphoron of oreos and other ecstatics for they asserted that their phantasms were real and that they remembered the things this phenomenon occurs when one regards as a copy that which is not a copy exercise in repeatedly recalling a thing strengthens the memory this however is nothing more nor less than the frequent contemplation of a thing as a copy and not as an object in itself the nature of memory and of its process has now been explained as the persistent possession of an image in the sense of a copy of the thing to which the image refers and it has been further explained to what faculty in us this belongs viz to the primary power of sensation and to that organ whereby we perceive time chapter two the subject of recollection remains to be treated first of all we must take as presuppositions the truths which were established in the treaties on argumentation accordingly recollection is neither the recovery nor acquirement of a memory for when one learns or acquires an impression for the first time one does not recover any memory for none has preceded nor does one acquire an initial memory but when a persistent mental condition and impression is fixed in the soul then we have memory consequently memory is not produced simultaneously with the production of an impression further in the indivisible complete moment when the impression is first received the impression and the knowledge are recorded in the affected subject if one can call this mental condition and impression knowledge and there is nothing to prevent our remembering in the sense of accident a certain thing which we know conceptually but memory as such is not possible until after the lapse of time for what we remember now we have previously known or experienced but what we experience now is not in the present moment remembered further it is evidently possible to have in memory what we do not now recollect but what was once perceived or experienced when one reacquires knowledge or sensation or whatever the mental possession be to which we apply the term memory it is then that one recollects one of the aforesaid mental possessions the process of memory takes place and memory ensues neither do the phenomena of recollection if their occurrence is the repetition of a previous recollection follow absolutely the same order but sometimes they occur in one way and sometimes in another it is possible for the same individual to learn and discover the same thing twice recollection then must differ from learning and discovery and there is need of greater initial latitude here than is the case with learning recollection is effected when one suggestion succeeds another in natural order if the succession is a necessary one it is plain that when the antecedent suggestion is given it will excite the succeeding one if however the succession is not a necessary one but only customary the recollection will be stirred generally but it is a fact that some persons by being impressed only once are trained in a given way more than others after frequent impressions and so there are some things which after we have seen once we remember better than others do who have seen them frequently when therefore we recollect we awaken certain antecedent processes and continue this until we call up that particular experience after which the desired one is wont to appear that is the reason why we hunt through a series in thought beginning with an object presently before us or with something else or with an object that is similar or opposite or contiguous in this way recollection is awakened for mental movements in these instances are identical in some cases in others simultaneous with the desired experience and in other cases they involve a portion of it so that there is a small remainder whose stimulation ensues this then is the way in which people try to recollect and without conscious effort they recollect in this way 
when the desired experience is recalled as the sequence of another experience for the most part however the desired experience is recalled only after several different suggestions such as we have described have proceeded one does not at all need to look at the remote and ask how we remember it but at what lies near before us for the same method applies to both cases i mean the method of sequences without any prior effort to find this sequence and without recalling it for mental movements follow one another this one after that by habituation when a person wants to recall a thing he will do the following he will try to gain a starting point in the process in sequence to which the desired experience was had consequently recollections which are awakened from the starting point are most quickly and best affected for just as things are mutually related in their order of succession so also are the mental processes and such things as have a fixed order are easily remembered as e g mathematical truths other things are remembered poorly and with difficulty recollection differs from relearning in this that there can be in the former case a sort of self-movement back to that which follows upon the original experience when this is not done but the recollection is prompted by another person then it is no longer memory oftentimes one is unable to recollect a thing but after searching succeeds in finding it this seeking and finding is what happens when one awakens a number of experiences and continues to do so until one sets that particular experience in motion upon which the desired thing is attendant memory is the possession of an experience potentially revivable this process is effected as was said above in such way that it comes from the person's own effort and from the movements in his power one must however have a starting point and so persons appear sometimes to recall things from local suggestions the reason is that one passes rapidly from one thing to another e g from milk to the suggested idea of white from white to air from air to the moist and from this one recalls the late autumn which is the season one was trying to think of in general it is the middle two of the entire series that seems to be the starting point for memory for when a person does not remember earlier then he does so when he comes to the middle point or when he does not remember here then at no other point at all as is the case e g when one passes through the series a b c d e f g h if one does not remember at h one remembers when one comes to e provided one is in quest of f or g for from that point the movement of suggestion is possible in both directions towards the point d as well as towards the point f if however a person is not in quest of one of these he will remember on reaching c and if not then he will remember on reaching a and this is the case always but from the same point of suggestion one sometimes remembers and sometimes does not the reason for which lies in the possibility of movement in more than one direction from the initial point e g from e to f or from e to d if the movement is influenced by an old suggestion it takes place in the direction of the more fixed habit for habit is second nature consequently we remember easily what we often ponder for as one definite thing succeeds another in nature so it is also in our activity frequent repetition produces nature since we find in the realm of nature occurrences that violate her laws and are due to chance much more do we find this in the realm of custom to which the term nature cannot be applied in the same sense the consequence is that a movement here sometimes takes place in one direction and sometimes in another especially when the mind is distracted from a particular point to something else therefore when one has to remember a name and remembers one like it one commits a solecism in regard to it this then is the way in which recollection takes place 
the most important thing here is the necessity of appreciating time whether in a determinate or an indeterminate form there must be some power whereby we distinguish a longer from a shorter interval it is natural that the same conditions which apply to magnitudes apply here also for we think what is large and what is remote in space not because thought extends to the given point as some say in their explanation of vision for we can think the non-existent as well as the existent but because of an analogous process in the mind for the figures and processes that correspond to things are in the mind itself what difference will it make then whether one thinks what is larger or the other class of things that are smaller for all the internal elements are smaller and the external have as it were a proportional magnitude to them it is perhaps in the case of distances in space just as it is with figures one has to assume the possession of another analogous figure in the mind itself so e g if one draws the lines e b and b e one produces c d for a c and c d are proportional why does this produce the line c d rather than f g or is this due to the fact that as a f is to a b so h is to m for these lines are drawn at the same time and if one wants to think the line f g one thinks similarly the line b e and instead of h i one thinks k l for these are related to each other as f a to b a when the suggestion of the thing and the suggestion of time coincide we have actual memory when however one believes one does this without really doing it one only believes that one remembers for there is nothing to prevent one's being deceived and fancying that one remembers without this being actually the case in actually remembering it is impossible that one should not believe one is remembering but should be unconscious of it for this is just what constitutes memory if however the suggestion of the thing and the suggestion of time are separated from each other then no memory is awakened the suggestion of time has a twofold meaning sometimes a thing is not remembered in determinate time e g that day before yesterday one did something or other in other instances one remembers in terms of time measure memory however takes place even if one does not remember in the latter way people are wont to say that they remember although they do not know just when a thing happened in cases where they are ignorant of the determinate measure of the when we have already said that the same individuals are not endowed with good memory and good recollection recollection differs from memory not merely in the time element but also because many animals share the endowment of memory while none of the known animals one may say excepting man is endowed with recollection the reason for this is that recollection is a sort of syllogistic process in recollection one reasons that one has known or heard or had some such experience of the thing in question and the process is a sort of inquiry and this is naturally found only in those creatures which have the power of deliberation and deliberation is a kind of syllogistic procedure that this condition affects the body and that recollection is the search for an image in a corporeal organ is proved by the fact that many persons are made very restless when they cannot recall a thing and when quite inhibiting their thought and no longer trying to remember they do recollect nevertheless as is especially true of the melancholic for such persons are most moved by images the reason why recollection does not lie within our power is this just as a person who has thrown an object can no longer bring it to rest so too one who recollects and goes in search of a thing sets a corporeal something in motion in which the desired experience resides 
especially disturbed are such persons as have moisture about the region of sensation for they do not easily come to rest after being stirred into motion until they attain the thing sought for or the movement has taken its proper course consequently the feelings of anger and fear when they once set up a movement do not cease although opposing movements are started against them but on the contrary persist towards their own aim this affection resembles names melodies and words when these are given violent utterance for after one has ceased the singing or speaking recurs involuntarily further those whose upper body is too large and also dwarfish persons have less power of recollection than those of the opposite physical structure because the former are too heavy about the organs of sensation and because the initial movements cannot persist but are destroyed and direct movement in the process of recollection cannot readily take place also the exceedingly young and the very old do not recollect well on account of their movement for the latter are in decline and the former in rapid growth furthermore children are like dwarfs until they advance in age we have now treated the subject of memory and its process its nature and the physical organ whereby animals remember also the subject of recollection in its nature its forms and its causes End of chapter 2 and end of On Memory and Recollection Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards